welcome to the Dean's Law and Policy Series, uh, number two. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Professor Julian Arado here with us this afternoon to talk about trade policy and the politics of trade. I'm going to tell you just the most minimal amount uh, about Professor Arado. Uh, he's very, uh, very well esteemed, uh, highly esteemed and well credentialed. He joined Brooklyn Law School three years ago. Uh, we're delighted to have such a prominent scholar and uh, wonderful teacher on our faculty. He's got a wide ar array of uh, intellectual interests from international economic law to private law theory to uh, public international law to contracts and today I've asked him to pick a topic, which he's done, uh, that he's very interested in and he, he has been working on and that definitely intersects with current political controversies. So without further ado, here's Julian Arado. Thank you so much, Dean Fullerton for making this, this possible. It's a really a wonderful series because it's a chance for all of us to talk about all of the basics that we, we teach you in our kind of gut classes uh, in a context that's more relevant to the many, many political crises of the day. Uh, so it's a great series. So thanks for letting me take part in the second one. So the title of the talk is Trade Policy and the Politics of Trade. And that's also going to be the structure of the talk. And I'm going to talk for 20, 25 minutes and then turn it over to a discussion with all of you guys. And the top line kind of takeaway is that that which makes good trade policy is also what makes trade bad politics. Or the flip side of that is crazy, crazy trade politics can, can be very good politics, but incredibly damaging trade policy. So what I want to do is introduce you to the promise and pitfalls of international trade and free trade in theory and in practice. But free from the vitriol of current political debates about trade. So you can't really glean too much about how trade works by listening to political speeches because the politics of trade are so distorted. So in order to kind of understand the developments that the Trump administration has been putting forward on both the tariff front and the trade deals front, you have to kind of understand a little bit about the background and the theory of trade, what trade is supposed to be accomplishing in order to kind of in clear eyes assess what's been happening. Spoiler is that what's happening is bad and makes no sense. Okay. So the first part of the talk will be the policy. The second part will be the politics of trade. And there I'll focus on the tariff policy, especially the tariffs on washing machines, solar panels, on Chinese goods just generally across the board, on steel, and potentially on autos. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the trade deals. The Korea deal, the chorus, and the TPP, which exists but not with us. And of course, the new NAFTA, we can talk a little bit about it. I'll talk a little bit, but we can talk more in the, in the Q&A. But though we're talking about trade, the first thing that I want you to understand is this isn't just a technical discipline. What we're talking about is politics of the highest order, national and domestic. We're talking about economy and society at its fundamentals. What kind of society do we want to live in? Our trade policy is fundamentally a part of that question of interest and values. And we're also talking about ideology. Trade policy intersects really nicely with some of the most vicious ideological developments that we've seen. The rise of xenophobia in America can only be accounted for in connection with what you often hear called economic anxiety produced in part by trade policy. So these things are hand in glove. But in order to understand all of the connections, we need to start with the basics. So we begin with the theory. So what's the broad rationale for free trade? What's the idea that we're trying to capture with lowering barriers to trade and reducing tariffs? The broad rationale for free trade is that first, international relations are not zero sum. There's not just winners versus losers. We can all win more if we win together. That's the first insight. And the second insight, more specific to trade, is that we're all better off trading than trying to produce everything on our own, trying to produce everything nationally. So the free traders make two main arguments for liberalizing trade. And some of this stuff will be familiar to some of you guys. I apologize if you've heard me go on about this before. But you have to listen again. So the two main arguments for trade are efficiency on the one hand and comparative advantage on the other. So first, efficiency. Free trade, the idea is, lowering barriers to trade, introduces 
international competition. And it's kind of obvious, right? If you lower trade barriers, there are going to be more foreign firms bringing goods in to your country, and that will make things more difficult for domestic producers. But that might be a good thing. That difficulty might force firms, and indeed entire sectors of the economy, to pay attention to matters of cost, to pay attention to reducing unnecessary wasteful costs. And that has societal benefits, right? The societal interest here is that efficiency creates wealth for all. Trade makes everybody richer. It raises some incomes, might lower other incomes, but as importantly, it lowers the costs of goods and services, goods and services. So trade raises the standard of living for everybody. That's one argument. And we're going to have to problematize that, right? I don't want you to take this at face value. But there's an essential truth there. The second argument is comparative advantage. This is a little bit trickier, and I don't want to get too into the weeds of it. But the idea is essentially that every country does some things well. And it's true, not every country has something that it's the best at in the world. But every country has some things that, relative to everything else, it does the best. It's the most efficient, based on level of education, based on historical traditions, based on resources available, etc. So the idea is that it pays for each country to focus on what it does best. It's able to generate the most income domestically by doing so. And the way to kind of click this in your mind is a pretty simple parable. It's a parable about a lawyer and a secretary. So imagine you have a lawyer at a big law, law firm, right? And the lawyer has a very highly paid assistant. Imagine the assistant is sick one day, so the lawyer says to herself, OK, uh, I just have to collate my own documents and staple them myself and do all this work myself because it's got to get done, and otherwise I'm not going to get my brief in. Right? So she's doing all that work. And another attorney comes up to her and says, oh, you're pretty efficient at all this. You're stapling these documents very quickly. You're faster than the secretary was. So maybe you should be the one doing this work, and we should fire the secretary. Save a lot of money. Let's say the secretary is being paid $50 an hour. It's a high rate. right? Save 50 bucks an hour. Do the work yourself. At first, this might seem like a sensible use of time and money. But immediately, you realize this is completely crazy. Remember, in the hypothetical, it's a big law firm. A big law attorney bills out, even in the first year, something like $650 an hour for their time, something like that. And so if that lawyer is spending an hour of the day doing secretarial work, even more efficiently, that attorney is wasting hundreds of dollars in business that could have been coming into the firm. The same goes for countries. The idea is that it pays to specialize. You should dedicate all of your resources to those things that you're best at, in theory, because that way you'll be generating the maximum amount of income for the country as a whole. Now, this is obviously something that can be complicated. I don't want to go too far into it, as I said. The one thing I would stress is that even in theory, no one would suggest that a country's comparative advantage stays the same over time. It's not like, oh, great, rich countries have a comparative advantage in tech and computers and all this high value stuff. And poor countries, you should stick to producing agricultural goods and producing textiles because that's what you're good at. And just stick with that and you'll be fine. Right? That's ridiculous. The idea is that comparative advantage is dynamic. In the short term, a country should spend their energy through state policy dedicating efforts towards what the country is best able to produce efficiently now. And then reap the rewards through a taxation system, dedicate money, public money, towards education and towards infrastructure and the kinds of things that allow a country to change its comparative advantage over time and produce more high value goods. It's a nice story. And again, it's complicated in the real world. It's not something so easy to imagine. But there's an essential truth there. It does pay to specialize. So these are the two arguments marshaled in favor of free trade, efficiency and comparative advantage. What you need to keep in mind is that even under the most favorable theories of free trade, the idea is not that everybody will be equally well off. The idea is that free trade makes us all richer, but it makes some much richer than others. Still, it's good to be richer, right? It's sacrificing some equality in the interest of raising the standard of living for everyone. So that's, that's the promise of free trade. So now, in, in a real world sense, why, why does liberalizing trade matter? Why does progressively reducing barriers to trade affect this whole calculus. 
The classic argument is just the invisible hand. The idea is that freeing trade pushes every firm, indeed every sector in society, to think critically about costs and reduce waste. That's efficiency. But also, introducing domestic competition pushes the economy as a whole to its comparative advantage. So it's not just a matter of state policy. Once you open the door to international competition, you're going to have to focus, com companies are going to have to focus on what they're best at, because otherwise they will be driven out of business. That's the idea. So goes the basic theory of free trade. But now we have to ask ourselves whether this is justified. Most economists worth their salt say at least those two principles are correct in some sense. They might be outweighed by other things, but it is true that trade leads to more efficiency and trade pushes the economy towards its comparative advantage. And those can be good things if mediated the right way. As importantly, probably more importantly for policy, because it's not economists who make policy, it's states that make policy. States of all political and economic stripes seem to buy into this. So take the examples of the United States, France, and Sweden. Sweden is as close as we can get to a social democracy in this world today. And France is sort of in between. It's a pretty robust welfare state. And the US is getting closer and closer to the libertarian ideal and closer and closer every single day, right? Less of a safety net every single day. So those are very, very different approaches to the domestic economy. And yet each one of those countries has exactly the same posture towards international trade, or at least I could say that until 2016. Right? All of these countries pursue as absolutely free liberalized trade across most areas as possible. So the point here, the key idea, is that freeing up trade does not determine domestic policy in terms of carving up the benefits reaped from free trade. Each state can choose the level of redistribution that it wants while opening up trade externally to any degree. So what the free trader says is, I just make the cake bigger for everyone. How you cut it internally depends on your own system of taxation, your own internal safety net, your own domestic policies. That is up to you. I just make the cake bigger. Free trade raises all boats. And you can decide what kind of boat you want to live on, a galleon, a slave labor boat, whatever it is. That's up to you. I have nothing to do with it. I'm just an economist. I'm a noble professional. That's all I do. So this is true at a societal level. There's something deeply true about this. The problem is that within each society, in the real world, the gains and losses of trade are felt extremely unevenly. So to understand the politics of trade, we have to better understand how trade policy cashes out in practice, not just at the country level, but also within a society. And it's helpful here now to focus on our own society, which we know the best. Most of us know the best anyway. So we have to ask the question directly. Within the US or within any country, who wins and loses from freeing up trade? Who reaps the benefits of free trade? So the number one winner in free trade is all of us as consumers, right? The idea of free trade is that all, whatever else it does, it makes goods cheaper. It makes goods cheaper for everybody. So it raises the standard of living for everybody. So all of us are beneficiaries of free trade in some sense. Now that might be outweighed for some of us a lot, but at bottom, all of us do gain something. Our fruits and vegetables are cheaper, our linens are cheaper, our iPads are cheaper, our iPhones are cheaper, our cars are cheaper. Everything costs less. So money is policy, right? That matters. But there are distinct losers from trade, and some win a lot from trade. So shifting the glare away from consumers, it's worth looking at other kinds of actors. What about domestic industries? Well, when we focus on them, there are both winners and losers from trade. The first thing to understand is that exporters are the biggest winners from free trade. American companies that produce goods for sale abroad are going to win when other countries lower their barriers to trade because now they can compete against potentially inefficient foreign competitors. Right? So exporting, countries love, exporting companies love free trade. Free trade means access to ever greener markets. Now, some domestic producers, on the other hand, are going to lose big. Many domestic producers that have been operating under this nice sheltered bubble of tariffs, once those tariffs are removed, will find it very difficult to compete with leaner and meaner foreign companies that are producing the same kinds of goods. If you produce screws and you can charge a dollar a screw and another company comes from abroad charging five cents a screw, 
You're out of business. I won't make the obvious point. So that's true, but don't make the mistake of thinking domestic producers lose across the board. There are actually lots of domestic producers that win from free trade. So first, one big winner is in a modern disaggregated economy, domestic producers that produce final products actually win from free trade. So imagine a car producer. They don't have to make everything locally. Other countries produce car parts, and if you can get those parts cheaper and import them, then maybe you can reduce prices on your cars and outcompete other auto producers. Right? Same goes for any kind of product. Many companies specialize in assembling final products but don't make all of the components. Computers is, are a great example. If you assemble computers, you might be a beneficiary of increased access to cheaper circuit boards or microchips. Still other domestic producers might suffer in the short term from trade but win in the long term. It might be that in the short term, foreign competitors push you to think carefully about costs, become leaner, and reduce dead weight. But you might come out of that a more efficient company in the long term. Right? So it's a dynamic process, and there are going to be losers from free trade, but there are also going to be domestic producers that win. And the same goes for foreign companies. Where things are most complicated is when we look later. And this is probably pretty obvious. A lot depends here on domestic policy. So the first thing to understand is that laborers do win something from trade. Right? They're all consumers. Laborers are consumers, and especially for the poor, the amount of your disposable income dedicated to purchasing goods, the percentage is really high. So if the cost of goods go down, proportionate to your income, you actually come out ahead. Right? But the problem is that as companies become more efficient, what that often means, it's code for layoffs. Right? And as companies close because foreign competitors come in, that means people lose their jobs. And it's great if your iPhone costs $100 less, but if you don't have a job, you're not buying an iPhone. And the five cents a day you're saving on broccoli is not going to feed your family. Right? So it's a huge problem for labor when opening up markets leads to efficiency that means job loss, right? even if there are societal benefits on the whole. Now, this is something that can be managed at the societal level pretty easily through progressive income tax, through redistribution, through safety net policies, and through worker retraining policies. And some countries do this very well. Scandinavian countries help the losers of free trade by putting them into higher value careers, or at least giving, making sure they have work. We do not do a good job of this. OK, so it's true that everyone can win from trade, but a lot depends on domestic policy, and there can be some serious losers from trade. So what you have to see is that there are, as a result, some valid critiques of trade and some kind of invalid critiques of trade that are still politically extremely potent. So let's start with the second, the sort of false consciousness critique of trade. This gets us to the politics of international trade. Trade is an easy scapegoat. The reason is that there's an asymmetry in pain and benefit felt from trade policy. Let's assume a trade policy that liberalizes trade and the result is reducing tariffs, reducing costs of goods, which everybody gains from, but many laborers are put out of work. Everybody is a beneficiary of trade, but the benefits are felt diffusely. In your day to day, you don't really think, oh, I'm so glad that I saved 20 cents on my groceries today or I saved you know, $50 on the iPhone. I, I, you don't even really notice because the price is the price. right? The price is set by Apple and you don't necessarily think, oh, that price is due to trade policy. right? You just buy the phone because Apple told you to in their most recent press release. So the problem is you are benefiting it, but you're not necessarily hyper aware of benefiting from it. By contrast, those who suffer from free trade those who lose their jobs are acutely aware of why they're losing their jobs. Right? It's obvious. And this is an extremely manipulable fact. Despite the fact that job loss is often as much associated with things like automation or bad social policy, trade is an easy whipping point. Because politicians can simply say, you're losing because of our free trade policies and the worst trade deals imaginable, and we're going to get your back. 
It's foreigners who are doing this to you. And we, the fools that we are, opened up our borders to foreigners to come in and outsource, to come in and take our jobs. And our only sin was letting them in. That's the line. It's an easy line because you're blaming someone else. And it's hand in glove with xenophobia more generally. Hand in glove with immigration policy. Of course it's false. Right? There's some truth to it, so that's what makes it potent. Trade does cause layoffs. And a lot of them. It causes outsourcing. But you can correct those things with domestic policy. It's just that those domestic policies are hard to pass. They cost blood, sweat, and tears from politicians who you know, don't particularly like to expend any of those things. So the politics of free trade are potent, but it's often based on this kind of false consciousness arising out of the asymmetry and pain and benefit felt by free trade. So that's one thing. That said, I'm not the most gung-ho free trader in the universe, so I don't want to give you that impression. I know it's kind of sounding like that. There are valid critiques of trade. There are critiques of trade that are valid from an internal perspective, so assuming what trade is supposed to do, free trade or the trade regime that we currently have might not be doing those things very well. And there are also external critiques of trade, which are valid, that despite free trade doing what it's supposed to do, we might be losing other things of importance. So what are the valid internal critiques that are coming more into view, especially after 2007 to 2008? Well, one thing that's clear and needs to be clear for anyone who has not studied trade law, we don't actually have anything close to free trade on the international plane. What we have is a system of liberalized and increasingly liberalizing trade that is extremely unfair to the developing world. So on the country level, there are major losers from free trade. The best story about this, and the best example to click into your heads, is at the negotiation of the WTO in 1994, there was a massive tariff round, a massive round of reducing tariffs uh, with massive negotiations among all countries of the world. And what ended up happening, for reasons I'm happy to get into in, in the Q&A if you're interested, is that the West were somehow able to secure massive reductions in tariffs for everything that they produce, tech, industry, manufactured goods, et cetera while somehow keeping tariffs incredibly high on agricultural goods and textiles, the kinds of goods produced by the developing world. So the theory of comparative advantage is all good and fine when you have perfect free trade. But if you don't, if you have distortions on trade that just so happen to negatively affect those who are able to produce those kinds of goods, the picture's not so great, right? You're basically saying, you should make your markets available to us, but oh, no, 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 our domestic producers of apples need to be protected by state policy. So on the societal level, country to country, there are massive losers from the way that we have liberalized trade. And what about distribution within even the rich countries? What's become clear since 2008 is that actually the distributional problems have gotten worse. So there's two different critiques here. One is an inequality critique, generally, and one is a labor critique. So yes, the USA has gotten richer from trade, and it boggles the mind to say that other countries are taking advantage of us, and we are the losers of trade. No, we've taken advantage of everyone in free trade, and the EU and the US have been the massive winners on the societal level. But that critique that others are taking advantage of, of us, it works because domestically, the rewards are being reaped by the very few. The culprits are not other countries, right? That's false. But nevertheless, the benefits of trade are being reaped at an increasingly, exponentially increasingly unequal rate. So the problem here is that the rich have gotten much, much, much richer. The benefits of free trade are being felt especially by big corporate interests. And you know, labor continues to lose as it has been losing for a long time. We all gain a little as consumers, but big business gains a lot. The second critique is more focused on labor. One group in particular always just seems to be the loser in the free trade battles. And we just don't deal with this well as a country. I alluded to this already, so I won't belabor it now, but we just don't have good policies for assisting those who are put out of work by trade. And you know, trade is partly to blame, but so is our domestic policy. There are also valid external critiques, and I'm happy to get into this more later, 
But the valid external critiques are that even when trade is doing what it's supposed to be doing, that might cause environmental degradation worldwide, or it might exacerbate problems with labor. So for example, free trade allows companies who might not be able to produce efficient goods because of local environmental standards to outsource their production to countries with more lax environmental policy. And on one hand, that's, you know, the pollution just moves, right? So there's less pollution here, more pollution there. But first of all, that's already messed up. But second of all, as in the world of climate change, these things aren't local, right? If you're producing carbon somewhere else, you're still pumping carbon into the atmosphere. So allowing companies to arbitrage their way out of environmental regulations is not great. Same goes with health. And there's similar critiques available for labor. Trade incentivizes outsourcing to, company, to countries that have laxer labor standards. If you have a $15 minimum wage in the US, companies are going to have an incentive, if it's efficient, to move their manufacturing abroad. So these are fair critiques. Uh, what's a little bit unfair is that trade treaties actually try to deal with these. So the TPP, the reason, the reason that Hillary Clinton made the statement that the TPP is the gold standard of trade treaties, which was a very ill-fated statement, and she probably should not have said that, uh, is because it had the most advanced environmental and labor standards of any trade treaty to date. It demanded that countries like Vietnam impose a minimum wage. Now, it didn't say very much. It didn't do a very good job, right? Vietnam wasn't willing to stick to a number, but that's something, right? And lo and behold, the new NAFTA actually includes those provisions from the TPP copy-paste into it, which is kind of a surprise. Thank you, Canada, for that. So how do the politics of this generally cash out? Democrats like free trade, and they like a strong safety net. The idea is to take care of workers and maximize advantage through education, health policy, et cetera. That means higher taxes. They don't admit it. You can't admit higher taxes, but that's the ideology. Republicans tend to like free trade, so everyone likes free trade, but they don't like internal safety net policies. The idea is free trade outside of the borders, but also reduce barriers to the functioning of markets domestically. The idea is suspicion of government intervention in all of these areas of policy. And I, I don't want to get into who's right or who's not. I mean, you know, I'm going to get into it because I don't have that kind of faith in markets, but it doesn't matter. We can disagree, reasonable minds can disagree about the balance between market and government. The Trump team, by contrast, wants to limit trade abroad without any safety net domestically. Reduce the safety net at home and limit free trade abroad. So the idea, in other words, is shrink the pie and do nothing to redistribute the small pie at home. This is not sensible economic policy, but it is extremely sensible politics. Because you can use the tariff stuff as a way to make it us versus them. Oh, China is screwing around with us, so we're going to impose tariffs on them. OK, who cares if it's going to reduce, if it's going to uh, balloon the prices of consumer goods? Because we don't care about redistribution at home anyway. So it's a good way to stay in power, but as economic policy and social policy, it's a disaster. So that's where we're at now, which is great. So I've been going on for 10, 15 minutes. Go on for about 10 minutes about contemporary trade moves. So the current trade policy is kind of hard to get a handle on. It's clear that the Trump team is happy to limit free trade. This is not a trade liberalizing fetish that they have. But it's not like they have a clear, coherent policy of how to limit trade. They have a much clearer policy of how to deregulate domestically. Do as much deregulation as you can possibly get away with, and you know, just do that as fast as possible. So run the jewels at home. But it's a little bit harder to get a handle of what they're trying to do internationally, and that's probably because there isn't a coherent policy. But we can look at the particular moves that they have made and try to understand them in terms of policy and politics. So the two big things are tariff decisions and trade deals. Starting with the tariff discussion. There have been sort of four waves of tariff announcements by the Trump team, and each one has been justified on different statutory grounds. So to raise statutes, the executive has to avail itself of particular statutory authorizations. Congress has the power to raise tariffs generally, but there are a few statutes out there that let the executive do it through a combination of the president and the US trade representative, the USTR. 
Those three statutes are sections 201, section 232, and section 301, and they've all been used. So 201 is the sort of most innocuous one. The idea of 201 is called safeguards. So there might be certain circumstances where you're worried that foreign countries are dumping products into the economy or using other unfair trade practices that are undercutting not only your firm's ability to compete, but the goal is to kill your firm, and then they will raise their prices later on. Right? So section 201 is uh, authorization to raise tariffs to safeguard domestic companies to help them deal with unfair pressure from abroad. So the very first experiment that Trump did in raising tariffs was invoking this statute, 201, to raise tariffs on washing machines and on solar panels. The idea was to safeguard washing machine companies and solar panel producing companies domestically. So put a pin in that, we'll come to it in a second. The second and the third moves were invoking a different statute, section 232, which allows the government to raise tariffs when it is the interest of national security, whatever that means, national security, the boogeyman. And on that authorization, Trump has authorized uh, massive tariffs on steel and aluminum and is now threatening to raise tariffs on autos, cars, for national security reasons. The third one is Section 301. Section 301 authorizes trade remedies. When you find another country is in violation of its trade commitments, the US trade representative is authorized to issue a report finding them in violation of their commitments and then levy tariffs against them to force them to bring themselves back into compliance with their obligations. And this is the one that's been used to attack China. The Trump admin has said in a 301 report that China is doing all kinds of things that are violations of their trade agreements. And you know some of them are just asserted. These haven't been proven really that clearly. Uh, and some of them are more boogeyman than real. And some of them might be true. And on that justification, the admin has levied tariffs across the board against China. Massive, 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 massive amounts of tariffs on enormous numbers of goods. So what we have to ask ourselves is, what is the justification for each of these rounds of tariffs? And then ask ourselves if the tariffs are actually meeting the supposed justification. Who are they actually helping? What are they actually doing? What's the actual effect? Well, you have to go one by one. So start with the washing machines. This is the easiest example. Putting to the side the question of whether other countries are engaged in unfair practices with their washing machine companies, let's just assume that they are. I, I don't know the evidence that they are or aren't. But this tariff was clearly designed to protect domestic washing, washing machine producers. That's obviously the goal, and that was obviously the effect. So that's the sort of test case, right? The point here is to make it easier for a washing machine producer to compete abroad by making foreign washing machine producers suffer the cost of tariffs. But what about the solar, the solar panels? Arguably, the rationale is the same. If we raise tariffs on solar panels, then it will be more expensive for foreign solar panel producers to import solar panels into the US, and that will be a big boon to domestic solar panel producers. The problem is that we don't really produce solar panels here. Those are produced in China. What we do is create arrays of panels and install them at high cost, but that cost has gone down substantially because cheap solar panels are available from China. And that means all of these people who are putting solar panels on their roofs are very happy to buy as cheap solar panels as possible from China because it'll reduce their energy bill and clean up the environment a little bit. So by putting tariffs on foreign solar panels, what this administration is actually trying to do is make renewable energy much more expensive. There's no domestic solar panel producer to be saved. They are protecting domestic gas, domestic oil, domestic electric companies generally. Now, you don't admit that, right? You just say, we're protecting our domestic companies. But the effect speaks for itself because there's no domestic solar panel producers of any note to be protected. You can do the same thing with the steel and the autos, right? With steel, okay, maybe there's an argument that steel is a national security reason to make sure we have a steel industry. And we're levying steel tariffs against Canada because maybe in a time of war, we might not be able to import steel from Canada. 
I mean, you'd have to think we're at war with Canada in this hypothetical, and you'd have to think that we are you know, not able to get our steel from anywhere else, so maybe it's World War Z, and we're at war with everybody, and we don't have any steel companies. It's just absurd at a certain point. But okay, look, steel is necessary for armaments. You kind of get it. Cars, we need to have tariffs on cars as a matter of national security. At a certain point, it strains credulity. What's really happening with both the steels and the cars and they admit it, which is sort of a strange thing. Trump admits it through a tweet. We're doing this on the basis of statutory authorization for national security grounds, and it's going to be great because it's going to help us bring other countries to the table where we can tell them, sign a trade deal with us and we'll reduce these national security tariffs against you, and then everybody will win. So they're just admitting that it's not about national security at all. It's just a bludgeon. And sometimes if you walk around with a big stick, uh, I guess it pays to use it. It's not really how the expression goes, but. <laughs> Last one I want to emphasize is the China tariffs. It is obviously correct that for many, many, many years, the US government has felt antagonized by Chinese trade policies for one reason or another, rightly or wrongly. It's obviously something that has been bipartisanly felt. And so it's kind of in some sense only a matter of time before some US government tried to mess with China with its trade policy. The line that you always hear is, oh, China's a currency manipulator, so we have to stop them with our trade policy. It's a little bit of a weak line because currency manipulation is extremely difficult to do. It's kind of hard to imagine that for anything but more than a short moment, any country can manipulate their currency in a way that they can actually make money off of you. Currency manipulation is not something that's easy to do, but it's a boogeyman. But, you know, there are trade tensions between China and the United States. But what happens? with the actual tariffs that are imposed. You read about this in, in Krugman's op-ed, if you had a chance to look at it, and it's much more artfully laid out there. But look at what is actually being tariffed. It's not final products. The United States is not imposing billions of dollars on tariffs on goods that are coming in from China that consumers might buy, and thus forcing the consumers to buy American goods that are slightly more expensive instead. Most of the tariffs are being imposed on inputs intermediate products and capital products, only a tiny percentage on final products. So who hurts from that? Who suffers from that? Yeah, consumers suffer, but also all of our domestic producer that buy nails or screws or circuit boards or whatever from China as part of their own products. So it's the most utterly self-defeating form of tariffs one can imagine. Meanwhile, look at the response tariffs that China is imposing on the US. They're on soybeans. They're on things that Chinese consumers buy. And they hurt the US, but they also hurt as few in China as possible. Is this just an act of insanity on the behalf of the, on the, behalf of the Trump administration? Not at all. This is not about just you know, taking as little effort as you possibly can to come up with a list of what to tariff. Actually, the goal here, the unstated goal, is to try to pressure American companies to bring jobs back from China into the US to produce not just the final good, but all of the constituent component parts in the United States. And that doesn't sound so bad if you could imagine creating more high paying American jobs. The problem is that it doesn't really cash out that way. The level of automation means jobs aren't gonna come back at the levels that they used to be. And it's not really that clear that those, com those companies are not just gonna outsource their jobs to Mexico instead of to China where it might cost a little bit more, but you know, not that much more. And it's still a hell of a lot cheaper than bringing back those manufacturing jobs to the US. So if you really want to bring back jobs through your tariff policy, you have to impose massive tariffs on everybody. And at a certain point, things become pretty dicey for us. Last point I want to make is about the free trade agreements. So what's the policy been with the free trade agreements? It's actually exactly the opposite. The weird thing with the NAFTA and the, the new Korean-US uh, trade agreement is that these are basically the same thing as we already had. Right? They, the administration comes out and says, we have these beautiful new trade deals, new, innovative, amazing. You've never seen anything like it, except we did see something like it. The Chorus 2.0 is almost 100% the same thing as the Chorus 1.0. The NAFTA 2.0 is almost 100% the same thing as the NAFTA 1.0, with the exception of the chapter on investment, which is my other field, and I'm happy to talk at length about that. But in terms of trade, it's the same deal. The amazing achievement of NAFTA 2.0 is that they managed to save this thing. It's not that they created something new, something special. It's just stunning that they managed to not destroy it. 
So it's a sort of a strange question about why we went through all this great trouble. And I think the story there is about the competing pressures within the administration of those who are in favor of keeping liberalized trade uh, and those who are against it. And in tariffs, those forces lost. But with the trade deals, they seem to have pulled the wool over the eyes of those who would favor destroying the deals that have been made so far. So that's where we're at now. It's not a super hopeful picture because the politics of trade are so potent that it's kind of hard to walk back from the edge. But you can see that you know through the dark, mysterious forces of the deep state, some progress has been made towards preserving the international trade edifice that we've built. And uh, you know, I hate to say this as a fan of democracy, but maybe the deep state will help us out a little bit further. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. That was very clear uh, and raised lots of questions and issues. And let's have some comments, thoughts, questions from the, the audience. Yes. If, um, if I'm an American producer, American company, and I, I guess uh, I produce my product in China and then ship it here, how does the tariffs affect a company like that exactly? So it's a little bit tricky. Uh, it depends on what you're producing and what you're shipping here. So if the tariff is on the final good and you're producing it abroad and bringing it here, it will be tariffed, right? But if the tariffs are on uh, you know, an interim part and you're bringing the parts here and manufacturing it here, then you'll be tariffed for the value of the part, but the whole good will be tariffed here. But, and, and as you know, you know, some of the difficulty here, it comes down to what's known as rules of origin. Uh, so there are these complicated rules that every state in the world has for determining when a good can be considered to have come from a particular country. And so companies can't play too many games with this stuff. Right, I, you know, you can't just basically make all of the parts in China of a car. Let's assume there are auto tariffs on China, right? You can't make every single thing in China in your own companies and then just ship them all here and, you know, weld them together in the U.S. You're probably not going to get away with that because there's a rule of origin asking how much value was created at each step of the way. So the USG is smarter, smarter than that. Uh, but the exact way that this cashes out does allow a lot of flexibility. So I want to talk about the investment provision in, NAF in the new sure. NAFTA and how is it affecting trade. Is it foreign direct investment investments actually that it was talking about? Yes. Okay. So, how, so your question is? What, what, what are the new changes in yeah. NAFTA 2.0 and how does it affect trade relations? So let me just yeah. back up for a second and clarify. The trade and investment are the kind of two pillars of international economic law and they deal with two very different kinds of problems. They're both about efficiency and you know, all of that good stuff. But trade is about barriers to goods entering, uh, going from one country, entering another country, or also services. Investment is about creating companies in a foreign country and you know, producing value there. It can be services, it can be goods, it can be an oil company, it can be anything. But it's about creating infrastructure abroad. And the risks there are quite a bit different. So the classic risk is expropriation risk. You, create an oil well in Venezuela, and after you've put in the work of exploring the oil, figuring out how much is down there, the Venezuelan government says, thank you, and just takes it, which happens all the time, right? So that's, that's the kind of general risk, and it's been expanded to involve unfair treatment of all different kinds. So what we're really talking about is a difference between trading goods across the border or creating uh, infrastructure and creating value in a country, and there are different kinds of protections that are needed. With goods, you want to reduce barriers as much as possible. With investment, you need to create affirmative obligations on the state to prevent them from taking damaging actions against you. And so the big difference in remedies is that with trade, the remedies are prospective, where if you lose a case at the WTO, all you have to do is reduce your measure, and for the period of time between the finding that you're in violation and you're finally getting rid of the offending measure, other countries can you know, take countermeasures against you. In investment, you get damages. If you have a company and the Venezuelan government takes it, you can sue them and they can owe you billions of dollars. So the incentives are totally different, uh, the actors are different, etc. The big innovation in investment law, and I'm answering your question now, the big innovation in international investment law is 
that international investment treaties give private actors a right to enforce their own claims, to sue the state that has offended them, and to get damages directly in an international court. Right? You don't trust domestic courts, so you go to a, what's called investor state arbitration, ISDS, and you bring a claim and you can get a damages award that you can enforce anywhere in the world. This is massively, massively costly. And it doesn't just apply to direct takings, it applies to indirect regulation, all kinds of stuff. So in trade, you can't bring those kinds of claims. What the NAFTA has done is it repeats all of the typical investment obligations that investment treaties have, but it has removed the right of private investors to bring those suits as between the US and Canada and mostly between the US and Mexico, except investors in certain sectors are still able to, able to bring those kinds of suits. Telecoms, natural gas, oil, and massive infrastructure projects. Now, the question that you should be asking yourself is, this is a formally reciprocal treaty that gives investors coming from one country or the other country the same rights. How much do you think Mexican telecom companies or Mexican oil and gas companies are operating in the US? Not much. So basically the US has preserved for itself a massive flexibility to sue the Mexican government for actions that it has taken, whereas Mexican producers have no, Mexican foreign investors have no such rights in the United States. But I just wanna add one more point to this because it's funny. This is a victory for Mexico. This is not a victory for the United States. It's a massive victory for Mexico. Why? Because those companies, telecoms, foreign direct investors in oil and gas, they are extremely powerful and they are able to get those kinds of protections through their own contracts with the state. So if they didn't have an investment treaty, ExxonMobil would go to the Mexican government and say, we'll come in and drill oil wells and we'll help your Mexican oil company, uh, state-owned oil company, but we're not gonna do it unless you give us contractual protection that gives us access to the same kind of arbitration that I was just talking about. So they're fine. So when Mexico gives this right away to these particular US investors, they see themselves as giving away something they were gonna give away anyway. And you have to ask yourself what they got in return for that. What they got in return for that is preserving so much of the rest of the NAFTA deal that the Trump team was trying to hack and slash away. So actually this is a startling victory for Mexico even though it looks like a return to the unequal treaties of the old colonial days. Thank you. That's investment. Other questions? Thoughts? Um, so you, you presented like the classic free trade, the defense of free trade. And I just wonder, are there alternative explanations that may, may play out in some of these, um, in some of these debates? So you think about um, the protectionism of, of the Asian tigers of South Korea or Taiwan, and they kind of took a different attitude yeah. and, and built up their, their they protected their, their infant industries and, and and play the trade game differently. And I didn't hear that in your, uh, your, your uh, narrative of free trade. And then another narrative I'm just curious if you could speak to uh, a bit more is the narrative of the sense that of China not playing by the rules with like intellectual property, mm -hmm. um, uh, protecting rights to intellectual property. And as part of this, just a, uh, a war by other means where it's kind of, we can't go at you directly for in this one area, so we're gonna go at you in this other area. And, is there kind of another unstated battle mm. happening that um, is not apparent from the headline? So, so I'll answer the second one first because it's easier. On the second one, there's no doubt that China has some trade practices which are extremely questionable still today, especially with regard to IP. And we're not so worried about copying Lonely Planet guides. It's more a matter of you know, having uh, US companies come to China and then just totally raiding their intellectual property through either you know, bring, stealing workers or just hacking. Right, has, happens a lot. So the US government for a long time has been upset about that, as you know. Uh, and so some of this is war by other means, emphatically not the case with the Latin American developing countries. Uh, these Asian economies in East Asia spent an enormous amount of effort in slow rolling liberalization by protecting infant industries to begin with and also limiting the ability of foreigners to you know, draw capital out of the country quickly and, and many other techniques that reaped huge rewards. They were able to develop more quickly and then over time liberalize their market. So now they all have much lower tariffs. Uh, and so the idea is that the free trade stuff does help but it does matter when you do it. And the, the sort of horrible example of this are the Latin American economies that liberalized trade but also liberalized finance and also capital markets all at the same moment uh, with the IMF's blessing, and that did not work out super well for them. 
Uh, what I would say, though, is that this is a story you often see with Joseph Stieglitz, Danny Roderick, uh, who's coming here next spring, and you should all come to his talk. It's going to be great. Um, you often see this story that it's a sequencing in trade, investment, foreign uh, uh, finance, f and capital markets, all at the same time as being sequenced the wrong way, and that has led to this, this problem. Um, but I think that trade in particular is not the driver of the real differential between Latin America and East Asia. The trade stuff is mostly just a benefit. It's the financial markets, the liberalizing capital markets, the liberalizing uh, access to financial instruments, and easy pulling out money out of the country that really led to the crises. And trade exacerbated some of that, but I, I, I think that's the sort of best way to view the story, that trade in goods is really not the culprit uh, of that sequencing problem, although one should still be careful when you liberalize trading goods. Yeah, so to, the point is that comparative advantage includes cost of labor, right? And so it creates this race to the bottom where many countries, their comparative advantage is cheap labor. So why don't we even cheapen our labor and take advantage of that? And it's a gigantic problem. And so this is a critique from, you can argue that it's a critique from within free trade theory or from without, uh, but it doesn't really matter. The point is that this is something that you need to address if as a world community we care about what happens to the individuals who live within these countries, right? I mean, why should trade policy just benefit those in countries which have you know, good labor standards and then everybody else gets kind of paved over? So I totally agree with you that this is a problem that needs to be solved. The question is how, how to solve it. In 1947, when the major international economic institutions were founded, there was also the International Labor Organization that was meant to deal with some of this, that was meant to create ever more robust and higher labor standards for the world. But the difference is that those are mostly non-binding instruments. And the major international financial institutions and the international trade organization, uh, which never got off the ground but became the GATT, uh, those things are all heavily binding commitments. And so they kind of took priority. And the labor stuff, while the ILO is constantly producing general comments on the rights of laborers and human rights abuses and minimum wage and all that stuff, it's all out there. It doesn't become binding international law except through very strange indirect means. For example, the European Court of Human Rights interprets rights of laborers in light of ILO commitments sometimes, which is bizarre as a matter of international law, but as a matter of policy, maybe a good thing. Um, so the way to deal with this, I would say, is through modern trade treaties. The problem, if you read the, uh, the op-eds, you, you'll see that the modern trade treaties are being driven not by a desire to reduce tariffs anymore, but by a desire to entrench corporate interests, especially pharmaceutical interests, but also other kinds of big agricultural in interests, um, instead of trying to really redress problems of labor and problems of the environment. They're making a little progress there. They're doing better than the old ones. But there needs to be a sort of shift in the way that we think of how to negotiate new trade treaties. The problem is, ask yourself who's doing the negotiating. This is special interest capture par excellence. The USTR views as its client big business. Right? There's a revolving door between USDR members and major businesses, and they're just not looking out for international labor. So you have a real problem of aligning those interests because you need to find someone who's going to do it. The best example of this, the Clinton administration, they're not the most you know, social welfare-oriented administration that we've ever had, but you know, they were into that kind of stuff for Americans. And yet the Treasury Department at that time was one of the strongest proponents of reducing these kinds of labor laws abroad. And not, just, not directly, but through trade liberalization without advancing labor standards. Yes, and uh, let me just say, I know some of you have two o'clock classes, so let's have this be the last question uh, for the day, but there are many more occasions. So you mentioned, so you mentioned that the uh, 
new NAFTA has some changes from the old NAFTA. Do you think that any of these changes will have any significant economic impact? Okay, uh, so because I'm not actually an economist, I can do the thing that economists would never do in this setting and say, I have no idea. Uh, I don't know, the, but I can tell you that they will have an impact, right? So they'll have a legal impact and they'll have policy impact. I don't know what that will do to trade flows. I can't predict that. Nobody can predict that. Right? There's a lot of other factors that go into that. Uh, so the first, an first half of the answer is with respect to trade and goods and services, the sort of guts of trade, no change. Why? Because the NAFTA is the same, right? And same thing with regulatory standards, harmonization of regulatory standards and those kinds of things. Uh, IP protection is a little stronger than it used to be. I'm not sure what economic effect that will have, except making a few people a little bit richer and making drug prices a little bit more expensive, but it sucks, but it's not a great economic effect, right? Uh, with investment, though, I think there is a very strong effect. So investors from the US uh, now are not able to avail themselves of the protection of the investment, investor state arbitration, and that matters uh, I can't tell you if it's going to have an economic effect because we don't actually know empirically whether investment treaties promote foreign direct investment at all. So what I would actually say is it's a great test case to see if limiting this access to super special arbitration only available to foreign investors actually affects FDI flows or not. So it's kind of a grand experiment and we just don't know which way it's going to cash out. But one thing is for sure, it reduces pressure on domestic regulatory policy. Because now Mexico knows that if we regulate the environment, we are less likely to get sued by U.S. oil producers who are pissed off at us. So, uh, on that note, uh, asking to uh, predict the future uh, and uh, saying we've got a grand experiment, let's, let's keep tuned. I'm sure we'll have other op opportunities to continue this and related discussions. And if you join me, I'm thanking Julia Morano. No, thank all of you. Really, it's been wonderful to talk to you.